we are going to expose eight myths, eight lies that many Christians still believe about the gift of speaking in tongues. Now, this is going to equip two different types of people. Number one, it's going to equip that individual who believes these lies about the gift of speaking in tongues and therefore has trouble allowing that gift to flow through them. The second person this is going to help is the one who believes in the gift of speaking in tongues, the one who uses the gift of speaking in tongues, and also wants to help others remove these mental blockages to allowing that gift to flow. Now, listen to what the Scripture says in Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. So here in the book of Psalms, we see that this prayer is being offered to God. This prayer saying, search me and lead me. Remove those things from me that are not of you. We need to learn to humble ourselves before the word. We need to learn to correct our thinking according to what the scripture says and to align ourselves in the light of truth. So if you want the Holy Spirit to show you what the Bible truly says about this beautiful spiritual gift. I want you to type these three simple words in the comment section. Lead me, Lord. That is your prayer. I want you to say it boldly. I don't want you to be ashamed of making that prayer. Lead me, Lord. All of us are being led by the Holy Spirit. All of us are seeking truth. All of us are trying to get a better grasp on what the scripture says, and we must be led by the Lord. So write those three simple words, lead me, Lord, even if you're watching on the replay. This is that commitment that you're making now. Put it on record to say, Lord, I want you to search for those things in me that are against your truth. I want you to search for those things in me that are anti your will, your nature, and I want you to lead me in the way everlasting. And so with that said, let's lay some foundational truths. Now, I am going to get into the eight myths. I know that often when we click on videos like this, we want the information to just come at us instantly. And usually I get right into the topic and I only lay foundations when I see it as absolutely necessary. And in this case, this particular foundation is absolutely necessary before we can cover these eight myths because it's going to help you understand the gift of speaking in tongues in a greater depth. And with that greater understanding concerning the gift of speaking in tongues, you are now equipped to see the myths and the lies for what they actually are. So I want to begin by sharing with you real briefly here the three expressions of the gift of speaking in tongues. Number one, there is the personal expression. Number two, there is the proof tongue. Number three, there is the prophetic tongue. So the personal tongue, the proof tongue, the prophetic tongue. Now you won't find these terms in the scripture, but you will see these realities in the scripture. There are many different things in the scripture, like for instance, the rapture or the Trinity. Those words aren't in the scripture, but you will see the principles very clearly laid out. And because those principles are there, we use the term that is biblically consistent to describe them so that we understand what we mean when we communicate with each other concerning these realities. So number one, is the personal tongue, number two is the proof tongue, number three is the prophetic tongue. Let me show you these three different expressions and how they look in the scripture. First, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. I'm gonna read verses one through four. Let love be your highest goal, but you should also desire the special abilities the Spirit gives, especially the ability to prophesy. For if you have the ability to prophesy or the ability to speak in tongues, you will be talking only to God, since people won't be able to understand you. You will be speaking by the power of the Spirit, so that's a reality. You are speaking by the power of the Spirit, but it will all be mysterious. But one who prophesies strengthens others, encourages them, and comforts them. A person who speaks in tongues is strengthened personally, but one who speaks a word of prophecy strengthens the entire church. Now here, Paul the Apostle is not speaking negatively of the gift of speaking in tongues, as we'll cover in one of the myths in just a moment. But here, I just want to highlight this simple reality that when you pray in tongues, there is an expression of the gift of tongues that is self-edifying. We see that very clearly here in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 1 through 4, where Paul the Apostle very clearly writes that when you're praying in tongues, you're speaking by the power of the Spirit, and you are strengthened personally. So that's number one, the personal tongue. That is one expression of the gift of tongues, and that is unto the edification or the strengthening or the spiritual growth of self. 
Number two, we see the proof tongue. In Acts chapter 2, verses 4 through 6, the Bible says, And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages, as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. At that time, there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. When they heard the loud noise, everyone came running, and they were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. So here we see the proof tongue. This is heard as an earthly language. So this is when someone supernaturally, now this is an amazing reality. And I've heard many stories from missionaries regarding this particular expression of the gift of speaking in tongues to where when they begin to pray in tongues by the spirit, this is incredible, an actual earthly language is heard by the listener. And so then the listener will sometimes get a prophetic word or hear the gospel message in their own native tongue spoken by someone who doesn't even know the language wow. and in many cases has never heard that language before. So that is a supernatural expression of this gift, and we call this the proof tongue. Number three, the prophetic tongue. Now, this is the expression of the gift of tongues that's used in a church setting or a public assembly of believers, where believers are gathered together from all over the region. They come together to worship, sing spiritual songs and hymns and psalms, and they come to hear the word and share encouragement with one another. They exercise their gifts. This is the gathering of the saints. This is where this particular expression is used, and it's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. I'm going to read verses 26 to 28. The Bible says, Well, my brothers and sisters... Let's summarize. When you meet together, one will sing, another will teach, another will tell some special revelation God has given. One will speak in tongues, and another will interpret what is said. But everything that is done must strengthen all of you. No more than two or three should speak in tongues. They must speak one at a time. And someone must interpret what they say. But if no one is present who can interpret, they must be silent in your church, meeting and speak in tongues to God privately. So here we see that in the church setting, what's to happen when this particular expression of the gift of tongues is used is an individual is to stand and gather the collective attention of those assembled in that body of believers, and that person is to speak aloud in tongues. And when they speak in tongues, supernaturally, someone else is to listen to that message that's being spoken aloud and then share that message with the rest of the believers. I've actually seen this happen, and it's actually a very powerful and moving thing to witness, because I remember several times in my church when I was growing up, I would sit in the church service, and there would come what I, 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 I describe as a holy hush over the room, where suddenly the worship's done, and the pastor's done speaking, and there's just this moment of pause, and you can't really manufacture something like that. It's just something that by the Holy Spirit, people are moved to do, and this very beautiful, weighty presence becomes manifested. There's a great reverence that comes on the room. The air becomes really thick with the manifested presence of the Holy Spirit, and then someone will stand up in their seat and begin to speak in tongues. I remember when this would happen, I would sit in my seat, this great reverence, this great fear of the Lord would come over people, and this great weight would come upon the room, and then this person would begin to speak in tongues, and as they began to speak in tongues, it was like that weight was intensified. I remember just feeling chills all over my body when that person would stand and begin to speak in tongues aloud, and it wasn't disruptive, it wasn't chaotic, it wasn't self-centered, it was beautiful, it was Christ-centered, it was God-glorifying, it was orderly, it was elegant, it, there was a, a majesty about it, there was a real classy way that this was carried out, and it was because it was all orchestrated by the Holy Spirit. And so this individual would stand, pray aloud in tongues, and then they would sit down, there would be another great moment of pause, another individual would stand, and then give the interpretation, and as they gave that interpretation, they would speak prophetically with such a weight behind their words that you can sense the words piercing your heart. That is the beautiful expression that is the prophetic tongue. And that's how it's to look in a church service. Now, let me embolden the distinctions here, and then we're going to get into myth number one. The first myth, by the way, being one of the more common myths, and again, this is for those of you who are struggling to receive the gift, or if you are helping others to receive this gift, or you just want to know how to better explain the gift of speaking in tongues to those who would ask of you. So let's embolden the distinctions between the three expressions as we see in the scripture here. So first of all, Let's look at the category of how these three expressions benefit 
the individuals or the people who are receiving the benefit from this gift. Now, as I go through these, you're going to see very clearly that there are, in fact, three expressions in regards to the gift of speaking in tongues. I just showed you real briefly the three expressions of the gift of speaking in tongues, or at least examples of how they work. And now we get into how they're more distinct from one another. So watch this. Number one, in the benefit, the personal tongue benefits the individual. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 4. The prophetic tongue, the one I just described, that benefits the entire church. And we see an example of this mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, and 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 26. And then we see the proof tongue, and the proof tongue benefits the unbeliever. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 22. Now, this is very different than the private personal tongue, because in 1 Corinthians 14, 22, we see that the gift of tongues can benefit the unbeliever. And then in 1 Corinthians 14, 2 and 4, we see that the gift of tongues in one expression can benefit the individual. And then again, in 1 Corinthians 14, 26, we see that the gift of tongues can also benefit the church. But again, we see the three expressions very clearly here when you look at how they benefit the individual or individuals receiving the benefit from each expression. Next, we see interpretation requirements. Requirements. There are different requirements of interpretation for each of the expressions of the gift of speaking in tongues. I'll show it to you. First of all, we see that the personal tongue, that is the self-edifying one, requires no interpreter or interpretation to be beneficial to the individual. Notice that in 1 Corinthians 14, 2 and 4, that Paul the Apostle writes that no one understands them, yet they're still strengthened personally. So there we see that an interpretation requirement is different for the personal tongue than, say, the prophetic tongue. And the prophetic tongue requires an interpreter in order to benefit the church. So 1 Corinthians 14, 26. And there we see that someone must interpret what is being said in order for there to be benefit at all. And that right there shows a very clear distinction between the prophetic tongue and the personal tongue. Number three, we see the proof tongue. And the proof tongue requires, watch this now, the proof tongue requires no interpreter for the interpretation to be understood by the unbeliever. An example of this is found in Acts chapter 2, verse 8. No one stood up and interpreted. No one stood up and said, hey, wait a minute, one at a time, we shouldn't all be doing this. But everyone who was present there listening, at least some, most I should say, we'll get into that in just a moment, they received benefit from having heard a message in their own languages. And that really is a supernatural interpretation, which did not require, by the way, someone to, to exercise the gift of interpretation. So when we look at the interpretation requirements, we very clearly see here, again, some distinctions. How many of you, as you're listening to this right now, let me know in the comments, are having light bulbs go off? You're saying, aha, I think I'm starting to see this very clearly. Let me know if you also know of other distinctions in these expressions. Number three, we look at how it's understood. Now watch this. The personal tongue is understood by no one but God. Now this is slightly different than interpretation requirements, but it's very similar. But still, uh, I think it shows us these distinctions, so I'm going to share these with you. So the personal tongue is understood by no one but God. 1 Corinthians 14, 2 says, only God understands you. So that is understood by only the Heavenly Father, that particular expression. Number two, the prophetic tongue is understood by the church with the aid of an interpreter. That's 1 Corinthians 14, 27. And finally, the proof tongue is supernaturally understood by the unbeliever. That's Acts chapter 2, verse 8. So there are very obviously three different expressions of one particular gift. And so now that these distinctions are in place, let's begin to look at some of the myths that many Christians believe about the gift of speaking in tongues. I'm going to equip you now. Now, I don't want you to use these and go around bullying people and showing off how much knowledge you have in the Spirit, but rather, I just want you to be grounded. I want you to be prepared to gently give an answer to those who ask about the gift of speaking in tongues, and I want to equip you to be able to help others receive this beautiful expression of the gift, and sometimes these mental barriers pre prevent people from stepping into what God has for them simply because they can't get past what they think about or what they've been taught about it or the myths that they've come to believe. Now, myth number one, myth number one, 
Paul discouraged believers from praying in tongues. Now, often when you talk to someone who doesn't want you to use the beautiful expression that is the gift of speaking in tongues, they're going to use 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 1 through 4, and they're going to use this as a way of trying to discourage you from using this gift. Let's take a look at this particular portion of Scripture to see if, in fact, Paul the Apostle was discouraging believers from praying in tongues. Let love be your highest goal, but you should also desire the special abilities the Spirit gives, especially the ability to prophesy. For if you have the ability to speak in tongues, you will be talking only to God, since people won't be able to understand you. You will be speaking by the power of the Spirit, but it will all be mysterious. But one who prophesies strengthens others, encourages them, and comforts them. A person who speaks in tongues is strengthened personally, but one who speaks a word of prophecy strengthens the entire church. Now, this is an often misunderstood portion of Scripture, particularly because people use this as a way of saying, well, see, Paul the Apostle wasn't a fan of the gift of speaking in tongues, or he didn't want people speaking in tongues, and he talked negatively of the gift of speaking in tongues. But if you look very carefully at 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 1-4, through 4, you see that Paul the Apostle is not condemning the gift of speaking in tongues. He's comparing the gift of speaking in tongues with the gift of prophecy. He is not by any means saying that the gift of speaking in tongues is bad. He's simply saying that the gift of prophecy is better. So when compared to one another, yes, you should choose to prophesy. Why? Because that benefits everyone, because everyone can understand what is being spoken prophetically. But when you speak in tongues, or at least use that uninterpreted version of the gift of speaking in tongues, then of course not everyone can receive from that. But still, in this particular portion of Scripture, we do see, in fact, that Paul admits that speaking in tongues is speaking by the power of the Spirit, and that speaking in tongues benefits the individual by strengthening their personal spirit man. So he's not saying that there's no benefit whatsoever. He's saying that the gift of prophecy has more benefit, and by the way, has more benefit in the context of a church setting. If you read 1 Corinthians 12, 13, 14, you very clearly begin to see that Paul the Apostle is talking about our interactions with one another. I mean, 1 Corinthians 12, you see the gifts of the Spirit mentioned. That's our interaction with one another. 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter, that's our interaction with one another. 1 Corinthians 14, he begins to call things into order regarding the spiritual gifts. That's our interaction with one another. So Paul the Apostle is speaking strictly about the expression of the gift of tongues that's used in public assembly. And of course, you're not going to go to a public assembly of believers and begin to speak in tongues without interpretation in a way that collects their entire attention. You want to use things that will benefit those who are gathered. So Paul was not a gift against the gift of tongues, but he definitely favored the gift of prophecy at least for the purpose of requ- uh, at least for the purpose of the assembled believers. He was comparing, not condemning. He was not saying the gift of tongues has no purpose. He was saying that prophecy has a greater purpose. Still, if that's not enough, we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 verse 5 and 1 Corinthians chapter 14 verse 39 that Paul actually encourages the use of this gift. 1 Corinthians 14:5 says, "I wish you could all speak in tongues." But even more, I wish you could all prophesy. There again we see, I wish you could all speak in tongues, but even more, I wish you could prophesy. So again, comparing, not condemning. For prophecy is greater than speaking in tongues, unless someone interprets what you are saying, so that the whole church, there again we see the context of public assembly, will be strengthened. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 39 says, So my dear brothers and sisters, be eager to prophesy, and don't forbid speaking in tongues. So very clearly we see myth number one busted that Paul discouraged believers from praying in tongues is just not biblical. It's a misreading of 1 Corinthians 14, 1 through 4. And of course, people are putting their own bias, their own spin on that particular text because they're anti-speaking in tongues. They try to say that Paul the Apostle was too, when in fact, he was in favor of it as we just read. Myth number two. Praying in tongues should not be practiced in public or group settings. Now, going back to what I was talking about regarding public church assembly, I want you to imagine this scenario. Imagine that you go into a church, someone's preaching a powerful word, it's speaking to you, it's piercing your heart, it's convicting you, 
It's being spoken in a way that has your attention, and the Holy Spirit is just ministering to you through the preaching of the Word. And man, it's just hitting deep. You ever have those sermons or those teachings that just cut right to the heart, and it's you can almost feel your spirit being strengthened like, like you're being fed properly? Well, imagine now that in the middle of that service, someone begins to stand up and start speaking in tongues, disrupts the sermon, and begins to speak in tongues for 20 minutes with no edification whatsoever, no interpretation. They sit down and the pastor says, well, okay, well, let's close in prayer and ask the Lord to bless us as we leave. And then the service ends. Well, you would be upset at that person and you would say, I was enjoying that sermon. I was receiving what was being said. And you, you interrupted with no interpretation your gift of tongues completely destroyed my ability to receive from the message that was being preached. This is what Paul the Apostle was trying to prevent. He was trying to prevent this disorderly use of the gift of tongues in public assembly. Now, he did bring order. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 14, 6 and 19. Dear brothers and sisters, if I should come to you speaking in an unknown language, how would that help you? But if I bring you a revelation or some special knowledge or prophecy or teaching... That will be helpful, but here's the context setter, but in a church meeting, very specifically he's saying here, in a church meeting, I would rather speak five understandable words to help others than 10,000 words in an unknown language. 1 Corinthians 14, 26, while my brothers and sisters, let's summarize. When you meet together, one will sing, another will teach, Another will tell some special revelation God has given. One will speak in tongues and another will interpret what is said. But everything that is done must strengthen all of you. Now, this does not mean that we can't pray in tongues collectively. We just can't pray in tongues disruptively. Imagine you're in an assembly of believers and the pastor says for the next five minutes, I want everyone here to begin to pray in tongues. Well, of course, people who've misread the writings of Paul will say, no, 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 no. You're not supposed to do that. You're not supposed to pray in tongues in public because it's disorderly. No, it's only disorderly if you're the only one doing it. You're disrupting the church service. You're grabbing the collective attention of those assembled, and no one is receiving an interpretation. But get this, if everyone gathered is praying in tongues, then everyone is being strengthened because 1 Corinthians 14, 2 and 4 says that when you pray in tongues, you are strengthened personally. So this is more about order. And again, it's not about publicly praying in tongues. It's about disruptively praying in tongues. I'll give you some biblical examples of people together praying in tongues collectively. Acts chapter 2, verse 4. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in tongues as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. Now, wait a minute. That's Acts 2, 4. Nobody stood up and said, wait, 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 wait. This is a wonderful gift of God, but let's make sure we take this all back to the privacy of our own homes. Make sure nobody does this and don't even tell them you prayed in tongues. That's something you got to keep between you and God. No, no one disrupted this. You might say, well, that was Acts chapter 2. And so that was the very beginning. They didn't know what they were doing with that particular gift. Well, let's look in Acts chapter 19, verse 6, where the Bible says, Then Paul laid his hands on them. The Holy Spirit came on them and they spoke in other tongues and prophesied. So here's another group of believers collectively praying in tongues. And this right here is something that they did publicly and collectively. Nobody stood up and scolded the group of believers. The Holy Spirit didn't pull back and demand that they wait until a later moment to pray in tongues. Why would the Holy Spirit, ask yourself this question, why would the Holy Spirit pour out a gift publicly that was meant to be used privately? He wouldn't do that. In fact, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 14, 22, so you see that speaking in tongues is a sign not for believers, but for unbelievers. Prophecy, however, is for the benefit of believers, not unbelievers. Now, wait a minute. In 1 Corinthians 14, 22, the Bible very clearly tells us that the gift of tongues is a benefit for the unbelievers. Now, how is it supposed to benefit the unbelievers if all I ever do is pray in tongues privately? This is not something that is really taught in Scripture. Again, this is just an idea that someone who doesn't like the gift of tongues uses, and they use it based upon misreadings of the writings of Paul. 
And so someone who's embarrassed of the power of the Holy Spirit, someone who wants to placate to culture, someone who doesn't want to offend those who are watching us, someone who wants to look like the cool church and doesn't want their church to be associated with anything that the world might deem as weird, they may look at these portions of Scripture and say, well, let's not do it publicly because, you know, we're growing a mega church here and we don't want the Holy Spirit disrupting what we're doing here. But as long as it's done orderly and not disruptively, it can be done publicly. So praying in tongues should not be practiced in public or in group settings. That's a myth that's just been busted using the scripture. Number three, this is number three, and this is an important one. And, and by the way, the reason I told you about the three expressions before I get into number three, the reason I told you about the three expressions of the gift of speaking in tongues is because you can see here in myth number two that Paul the Apostle was regulating the church use of the gift of speaking in tongues, the public assembly, the prophetic tongue, and this doesn't necessarily apply to the other two, the proof tongue and the personal tongue. And it couldn't possibly apply because we see the gift of tongues used and expressed in public settings and for personal use many times over all throughout the New Testament. Number three, tongues is only an earthly language, not a heavenly one. Now, this is a very popular view that's not supported at all by Scripture. Now, you can show me the Greek and show me that the, the word tongues means language. Yes, of course it means language, but we're talking about a spiritual heavenly language, and that's the difference. So language does mean language, but we're talking about a heavenly one as moved by the Holy Spirit, just like you can look at wisdom and knowledge in 1 Corinthians 12. Well, wisdom and knowledge in 1 Corinthians 12, anyone can have wisdom, anyone can have knowledge, but the gift of wisdom, the gift of knowledge, those are spirit-empowered uses of wisdom and knowledge. So in the same way, language can be a natural term, but when used in the context of the spiritual gifts, is a spiritual language empowered by the Holy Spirit. So context matters, not just the individual words. In fact, that's the very nature of interpretation. So 1 Corinthians 14, 2, watch this now. For if you have the ability to speak in tongues, you will be talking only to God, since people won't be able to understand you. You will be speaking by the power of the Spirit, but it will all be mysterious. Does that sound like an earthly language to you? Something that only God understands? Very clearly, we see here that that popular view that the gift of speaking in tongues was only an earthly language is directly contradicted by the scripture that we see very clearly in 1 Corinthians 14 too. It says what it says. Check this out, 1 Corinthians 14, 4, a person who speaks in tongues is strengthened personally, but one who speaks a word of prophecy strengthens the entire church. Here we clearly see that there is benefit to speaking in tongues that no one understands. 1 Corinthians 14, 14, also kind of the nail in the coffin here that shows us that it's not just an earthly language. For if I pray in tongues, my spirit is praying, but I don't understand what I am saying. So very clearly there we see that it's the prayers of the Spirit, the Spirit man coming through the expression of the gift of tongues. So it does not originate in an earthly realm. The gift of tongues originates in a spiritual realm, and it is a heavenly language. So yes, that word tongues does mean language, but in the context of the gifts, in the context of the Holy Spirit, in the context of 1 Corinthians 12, 1 Corinthians 14, very clearly we see that it is a heavenly spiritual language, and 1 Corinthians 14, 2 makes it clear that no one understands this language but God that we speak aloud. Now, what about Acts chapter 2? Because Acts chapter 2 is often quoted and used to try to limit people into only speaking earthly languages by supernatural means. Well, again, remember I showed you that Acts chapter 2, in context, is showing us the proof expression of the gift of speaking in tongues. It is the proof tongue. But let's take a look at this more closely, because you might be surprised to see that not even Acts chapter 2 is necessarily an airtight argument for the idea that the gift of tongues is an earthly language. Watch this, Acts chapter 2, verse 6. Now, when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man, so every individual in the crowd, heard them, collectively, the group, speak in his own language. So watch this now. Each individual heard the crowd collectively praying in his own language. So how can this have been if the interpretation was not on the listener's end? What do I mean by that? Well... If I get just, let's just say there's 12 of us. There's 12 people who represent 12 different languages. And we're all listening to a crowd. That crowd begins to pray at the same time. 
And each one of us individually hears that crowd, collectively speaking our individual language, that's proof that the supernatural interpretation was not on the speaker's end, but more likely on the listener's end. In fact, we see more evidence of this in the fact that not everybody even heard languages. This is why they assumed they were drunk. Acts 2.13, but others in the crowd ridiculed them, saying they are just drunk, that's all. So, to say that the gift of tongues is only spoken as an earthly language is a big assumption. It's not even something that's very clearly said in Scripture. Again, you can go to the Greek and go to the original a language to look at what that word means. Tongues does mean language, but again, the context shows us that it's a spiritual language. And Acts chapter 2 is more of a demonstration that it was on the listener's end, the supernatural interpretation, than it was on the end of the person who was speaking in that language. For each individual heard them collectively in their own language. Add to that the fact that some people likely didn't even hear them speaking anything coherent, which is why they called them drunk. Why would they call them drunk if they were speaking coherently very profound spiritual truths in languages that they did not know? Well, this is what you call explanatory scope. I want to teach you a term here. Explanatory scope is basically a term that's used to describe an, the power of an idea. So if I say that it was an earthly language, the scope of that explanation only touches on a few points. It only touches on the fact that each individual heard his own language. What it fails to account for is the fact that A, each individual heard the entire crowd collectively speaking in his own language, and B, it fails to take into account the fact that some people listening to this crowd thought that the people were drunk and therefore were not speaking coherently in the first place. So the best way we can look at this, the greatest explanatory scope that we can find for this is the idea that they were speaking by the Spirit heavenly languages and that each individual heard the interpretation supernaturally on their own end and this would also explain why they thought some were drunk. If this is helping you in clearing some things up, let me know in the comment section chat how many times have you heard people use these explanations to try to discourage Christians from exercising this very spiritual, very beautiful expression of the Holy Spirit's power. Now, number four, the gift of tongues is not for every believer. This is probably one of the greatest myths around this topic, that the gift of tongues is not for every believer. And some will even say something like this, and this is probably what I've heard um, people who don't enjoy the teachings uh, in regards to activating the gift of speaking in tongues. People will say something like, well, the gift of tongues is not something that you can teach. The gift of tongues is not something that everyone has. The gift of tongues is not something that you can activate. In fact, you can probably even look at the comment section of this video just a couple days from now, and I, I can almost guarantee you that there'll be a comment from somebody who says, you can't give, teach the gift of tongues, or you can't and give the gift of tongues to everyone because it's not for everyone. And you can't activate the gift of tongues. Look out for those comments and make sure to send them the time code to this exact moment because they probably didn't watch the whole video. Now, having said that, let me make it clear. No one is saying that they can teach you how to get the gift of tongues. So when I talk about activating the gift, I'm using language that's similar to the language that Paul the Apostle used when he was talking to Timothy when he said, stir up the gift. When I talk about activating the gift of tongues, I'm talking about using something that God has already given to you. So this begs the question, has God given the gift of tongues to every single believer? And that's the first question we should be asking. And then after that, we can explore whether or not these gifts can be activated. So when I say how to speak in tongues or how to activate the gift of tongues or how to remove blockages to the gift of tongues or how to unlock the gift of speaking in tongues, I'm not saying that I'm going to teach you how to receive a gift that God did not give you. Rather, I'm going to teach you how to surrender to the Holy Spirit in such a way that the gift that he already has given to you can be expressed through your life. So, gifts can't be taught because they're a spiritual sense. But this idea that the gift of tongues is not for every believer, I just needed to get that explanation out of the way because that's where people usually find their, their mental roadblocks. Um, but here we see this myth that we're addressing, the gift of tongues is not for every believer. Okay. This is where the problem usually arises. It's a misreading of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 29 through 31, where the Bible asks some rhetorical questions. Are we all apostles? Are we all prophets? Are we all teachers? Do we all have the power to do miracles? Do we all have the gift of healing? Do we all have the ability to speak in tongues? Do we all have the ability to interpret tongues? Of course not. Whoa, wait a minute, Brother David, shouldn't that be it? 
Now, wait a minute. I'm going to show you why this is not what many people think it is and why the scripture actually very clearly teaches that the gift of tongues is for every believer. Let me show you this. So you should earnestly desire the most helpful gifts, but now let me show you a way that is best of all. Now, when looking at 1 Corinthians 12, remember that Paul the Apostle is talking about the spiritual gifts. And in what context? Paul the Apostle is talking about the use of the spiritual gifts in the context of, remember, the assembly of believers. So, in 1 Corinthians 12, when Paul the Apostle talks about the gift of tongues not being for every believer, he's talking about the very specific expression of the gift of tongues that is the prophetic expression of the gift of tongues. In fact, we see that we're context clued into this reality by the very fact that the next rhetorical question is, do we all have the ability to interpret tongues? So here, Paul the Apostle is not saying that not every believer has the ability to pray in tongues. He's saying that not every believer has this public ministry, this public use of the gift of tongues and tongues interpretation. In fact, if you use the same logic on the gift of tongues, or on the other gifts that you do on the gift of tongues, I should say, if you use the same logic on the other spiritual gifts listed here that you do on the gift of speaking in tongues, you end up with a lot of problems. Say, for example, the word of wisdom and the word of knowledge. Well, very clearly we see that by the writings of Paul in 1 Corinthians 12, he's clearly telling us that some of these gifts are given to some of the believers. So should we then say that not every believer is called to use wisdom? Of course we don't say that. But do we also acknowledge that there's a special expression of wisdom found in the gift of wisdom? Yes, of course. What about the word of knowledge? Are we saying, well, you know, knowledge, that's not for every believer. Wait a minute. Doesn't the Bible say that you should be ready, prepared to give a, a reason for the hope that is within you? So shouldn't we all have knowledge? Yes. But we also acknowledge at the same time that there is a special expression of knowledge in the gift of the word of knowledge. Think about the gift of faith. Well, the gift of faith is a stirring of someone else's faith. We know that because 1 Corinthians 12, 7 makes it very clear that every spiritual gift is for the benefit of other believers. So then, this gift of faith right here is very clearly something that's given as a special expression. Does that mean, well, you know, not every believer should have faith. Not every believer has faith. God hasn't deposited faith in every believer. That's not true. We know that because it takes faith to be saved. So that particular gift of faith is a special expression of faith. What about healing and miracles? Does this mean that no believer can ask for healing? Does this mean that no other believer can experience a miracle in their life? That's just nonsensical to believe something like that. Yet, if we apply to these other gifts, the same logic that we apply to the gift of speaking in tongues, we would end up with these contradictions. So, no one else can believe for healing but the person with the gift of healing. No one else can believe for miracles but the person with the gift of miracles. No, that's not what we're saying. We're saying that there's a very special emphasis, an area of grace for a public expression of ministry with these particular gifts. Think about prophecy, discernment. Can we not all hear from God? Does God not speak to all of us? Does God not give all of us discernment? Okay, so if we wouldn't apply the same logic to all of the other gifts, why on earth do we apply that logic to tongues? Think about the gift of the apostle. No, we're not all apostles. Does that mean not every believer can lead? No, every believer is called to lead to some degree, either in their home, either with a friend, either with fellow believers. Are we all prophets? No. Does that mean we can't all hear from God? Not at all. It just means there's a special area of grace for prophets. Are we all teachers? Okay, well, that's it. Not every believer can explain the word. Only a few believers are allowed to talk about the scripture. Wait a minute, that's not what the Bible's saying at all. Yet again, if we apply the same logic to these gifts that we do to the gift of speaking in tongues, these are the contradictions we'd end up with. Do all have the power to do miracles? Do all have the gift of healing? No. Does this mean no other believer can believe for a miracle or believe for healing? No, that's not what we're saying. So why on earth do we use that same logic or that particular logic for the gift of tongues when we shouldn't? This is talking about a very specific use of the gift of tongues, namely the prophetic expression to be used in public assembly. Now watch this. Each one of the spiritual gifts is intended to help the body of Christ, 1 Corinthians 12, 7. In other words, the one who uses the gift isn't the one who benefits from the gift. We are given spiritual gifts to benefit others, not self. Let me establish that and make that clear. So then the gift of faith couldn't be having faith, 
It would have to be the ability to stir faith in others. The gift of healing isn't being healed. It's the grace to heal others. The same would apply to every gift about which Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 12. All of the spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians 12 are others-centered, never self-focused. So the expression of the gift of tongues here could not possibly be talking about the personal prayer language. Take, for example, all the scriptures where the believers are filled with the Holy Spirit. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in tongues. Everyone who was assembled. So, if you want to say that Paul was talking about, or if you want to say that Paul was limiting the gift of tongues or was saying that not every believer has the gift of tongues, be very specific like Paul was being, and at least be consistent with Scripture to say that this is talking about the public expression to be used in the assembly of believers in tandem with the gift of interpretation. Watch this even further. We see Paul the Apostle actually encouraging something here. In 1 Corinthians 14, 4-5, a person who speaks in tongues is strengthened personally, but one who speaks a word of prophecy strengthens the entire church. Watch this now. I wish you could all speak in tongues. But even more, I wish that you could all prophesy. Wait a minute. Why would Paul the Apostle wish for something that was contrary to the will of God? And why would the Holy Spirit allow for that desire to be recorded in a holy epistle if it were indeed contrary to God's word and his will? Not all have the gift of tongues and tongue interpretation, but every believer can pray in a personal prayer language to God. I'll show it to you. Acts 2.4, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them collectively. Acts 2.39, watch this, this is powerful. This promise, this is Peter speaking now, is to you, to your children, and to those who are far away, all who have been called by the Lord our God. Now, wait a minute. What's he talking about here? This promise that's for you, for your children, for everyone far off. This is, this is far reaching now, what Peter's talking about. It's reaching beyond into various generations. Generations and generations and generations of believers are to receive what Peter is talking about. And it's for all who have been called by the Lord our God. It doesn't say some, it doesn't say a select few. What was he talking about? Well, look at Acts 2.33, very clearly tells us. And the Father as he had promised, gave him the Holy Spirit to pour out upon us. Watch this now, just as you see and hear today. Wait a minute. What did they see? They saw the power of the Holy Ghost. What did they hear? They heard them speaking in tongues. And that which they heard and saw was the promise to them, to their children, and to all who believe. So, while the gift of tongues and tongue interpretations is not for every believer, the one that's used in the context of public church assembly to demand the collective attention of everyone gathered, that particular one that Paul the Apostle is talking about, that particular expression, yes, that's limited to a certain few, but not the personal prayer language. So no, the myth that the gift of tongues is not for every believer is simply not true. Hey, if this is helping you out, do me a quick favor. Hit the like button on this video. I'm about to show you other myths, and we're going to touch a little bit on cessationism too here in a moment. But if this is blessing you, if this is encouraging you, this is helping to break some mindsets in you, and you think it could be beneficial to others, or maybe you already knew this before and you're saying, wow, this is just really a good solid teaching that should help other believers too, then go ahead and leave a like on the video right now. This actually does help to spread the teachings further. And if you're new here, or you've been watching our videos, but you haven't subscribed yet, I encourage you, go ahead and subscribe. Subscribe to Encounter TV right now for Bible-based, Jesus-centered, Spirit-filled content. We love the power of the Holy Spirit. We love the Word of God. This is the channel for you. We found, actually, that about 60% of people who watch Encounter TV are not subscribed to Encounter TV. So make sure that you do, in fact, subscribe to Encounter TV, and I promise you will not regret it if you love teachings on the Holy Spirit. Okay. Myth number five, the spiritual gifts are not for today. Now, let me be very clear here before I get into this, because I could possibly start a theology war, though that's not my goal. I don't do the back and forth with other YouTubers. Uh, to me, that's just toxic, and I just, uh, it's, a, it's a big waste of time. I say just teach the truth, and eventually I do believe that the truth wins out. So 
I'm not trying to start a war with anyone. I'm not trying to go against. You may hear people teach opposite of what I'm teaching. Don't say to yourself, ooh, he's calling out so-and-so, but subtly in a way that he doesn't know. Look, I promise you when I put together these lessons, I'm not thinking about anyone else. I'm not considering what others are putting out. I don't speak against anyone. I preach for truth. And so as I go through this, we have to be careful not to demonize those who are considered cessationists. Cessationists are those who believe that the spiritual gifts, as we understand them in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, that those particular spiritual gifts, the apostolic gifts and so forth, are no longer for today, that they've just ceased to be, they're no longer in operation, and there are varying degrees of this belief, but I'm not, this is not a lesson on cessationism. I'm just directly, specifically addressing this myth that the spiritual gifts are no longer in operation or that the gift of tongues is not for today. So a cessationist is someone who believes that those gifts have ceased. Cessationism is the belief that the gifts have ceased. So here's what you're going to find when it comes to cessationism or people who say that the spiritual gifts are not for today. You're going to find three primary foundations for their arguments or for their, their, their communications. Whatever they think is truth, you're going to find three foundations upon which they place their beliefs. They build their beliefs on three foundations, and each one of those foundations is a very weak foundation. It's not the Word of God that cessationism is built on. It's, to me, I think it's a form of uh, atheism. And I know that sounds out there, but I do believe that it is a form of doubt and cynicism and atheism that possibly some people are battling. And so I think that atheistic thinking, I don't have time to get into the details of why that is. It's, it's a little on the psychological side. But I do believe that some of the mindsets of atheism are what ultimately lead to cessationism. But we can talk about that another time. Not in every case, but in many cases. So I'm not, I don't mean to generalize there, but Again, that's a whole different message for a whole different time. Okay, you're going to find that the three foundations are thus. Number one, speculation. Number two, arguments from history. And number three, poor biblical interpretation. You will often find that the people who protest what they think is unbiblical doctrine, the people who talk the loudest about being properly aligned with Scripture, often themselves refuse to be properly aligned in Scripture if it contradicts what their intellect thinks feels good. So some of these doctrines feed the ego. Again, there's a psychological aspect to this I don't have time to elaborate on. But number one, you'll find most cessation is built on one of these three foundations, speculation. I'll give you an example of this. Here's an example of speculation. Example one, only the early epistles mention the spiritual gifts but the later ones make no mention of them. So the gifts must have ceased. Example number two, Paul the apostle had poor eyesight because God didn't heal him. That demonstrates that the gift of healing and the other gifts along with it had ceased. Now, this is not in any way a biblical approach to things. This is just, again, speculative thinking based upon uh, some assumptions they're making about certain figures in the Bible. Here's the issue with that sort of reasoning. In order to demonstrate biblically that the spiritual gifts have ceased, you have to be able to point to the Bible verse that tells us so. You can't just say, we think it stopped, we think they no longer taught it simply because some people were sick. Otherwise, you're left with just speculation. The biblical evidence is overwhelmingly supportive of the spiritual gifts still being active today. It's not even close, if we're being honest about it. So, if you want to believe that the spiritual gifts had ceased, you need to bring some heavy biblical evidence that very clearly says what would contradict what the Bible actually says. And so you're not going to find that with cessationists. They're going to speculate or they'll say, well, you know, Paul told Timothy to take a little wine for his stomach's sake. Why didn't he just steal, heal his stomach? Um, you know, this idea that the gift of healing is something that you wield outside of the will of God, no one's ever believed that. The apostles didn't even believe that they healed outside of the will of God. The gift of healing works the same way it has always worked, under the sovereignty of God in partnership with the faith of man. So, no, speculation uh, is not a good foundation, and it's one of the primary foundations that you'll see when it comes to cessationism. You just got to ask more questions, dig a little deeper on their beliefs, and you'll find that it's not Bible-based, it's speculative. They're, they're, they're looking at scenarios in the Bible, and they'll say, well, Paul had a problem with his eyes, we think. Timothy had a problem with his stomach, we think. Um, there was possibly no mention 
of the spiritual gifts in later epistles. And after this certain date, we started to see them talk about it less in the epistles. So therefore, it must be so that the gifts had ceased. Well, that's speculation. And if someone wants to convince you to believe what the Bible very the opposite of what the Bible very clearly teaches, then they're going to have to do better than speculation. Number two, you'll notice they use arguments from history. I'll give you an example here. Some of the early church fathers believed that the gifts had ceased, and therefore we should believe the same. Well, look, we honor the early church fathers, but we're not going to idolize them. We honor the early church, but they didn't necessarily, not after the scripture was canonized, they didn't write the inerrant word of God. So we, we must not raise some of these early church historical church fathers. We must not raise them above the authority of Scripture. So the question is never, what did the early church fathers believe? It's always, what does the Bible teach? Now, here's something that very few people take into account. Even if you could prove that some of the early church fathers believed that the spiritual gifts had ceased, even if you can prove that, all that demonstrates is that there were cessationists that existed back then too. So it doesn't prove anything. It just shows you that there were people who thought in similar ways back then. So the debate is old, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's conclusive proof that the spiritual gifts had ceased. Watch again here, example number two, an argument from history. Um, they'll say things like, well, church history records a decline in the use of the spiritual gifts. Well, in order to prove that, we'd need a complete record of every believer's life. There are thousands of actions that you and I choose each week that there will never be a historical record for. So the question isn't, what does the historical record reflect? The question is, what does the Bible teach? Here's what I wrote for my book, Praying in the Holy Spirit. The cessationist is being presumptuous when he claims that generations of believers didn't pray in tongues. How on earth could the cessationist know what didn't happen in the early church? To know that, one would have to have a complete record of every life of every believer, a record detailing even daily activity. We don't have that. In fact, to make the claim that a certain Christian figure or group of people certainly didn't pray in tongues, we would need a record of them telling us just that. So anyone who tells you that the early church didn't pray in tongues is making a big assumption. In fact, it's presumptive to make that claim about any believer in history's timeline. So, arguments from speculation, arguments from history. Those are two of the three foundations that cessationism is built upon. Number three, we see the final one here, poor biblical interpretation. The burden of proof is left unfulfilled by the cessationists. You got to remember where the burden of proof lies. Um, and this is often part of the debate where they want to shift the burden of proof. If the Bible very clearly teaches that the apostles, the early church, moved in spiritual gifts, and the epistles of Paul talk about the spiritual gifts, then the burden of proof is on the cessationists to show us scriptures that very clearly indicate that the spiritual gifts have ceased. And so far, we haven't seen anything like that. I'm going to show you one portion of scripture that they use all the time, but that really fails when you take even just a little observation on that portion of scripture. Uh, same thing, for example, um, I just released the spiritual warfare teaching. I did a whole seven-part series on why Christians can't be demon-possessed. I laid out scripture after scripture on why that isn't so. And some will say, well, I don't need to show scriptures of Christians being demon-possessed. You got to show me scriptures of people uh, of where the Bible says Christians can't be demon-possessed. Like, you mean other than the, uh, the whole entire idea of salvation, you want to be shown that? So the burden of proof clearly is on the one who's making a claim that contradicts what the scripture says. So I'm just using that as an example to give you an idea of what the burden of proof means. So just as in the case of someone who wants to believe that Christians can be demon-possessed, they have to have the burden of proof placed on them because the Bible very clearly teaches the opposite. So in the case of the cessationists, the burden of proof falls on them. They have to show you very clear scripture that shows that the gift of tongues is no longer for today. They can't just assert that. They can't just mock the gift. They can't just complain about the gift. They can't just play videos of people praying in tongues saying, seeing, look how silly this looks. They have to show conclusive biblical evidence that the gift of tongues has ceased, and they don't have that. Here's what they do use. It's 1 Corinthians 13, 8 through 10. Prophecy and speaking in tongues and special knowledge will become useless, but love will last forever. Now, our knowledge is partial and incomplete, but even 
The gift of prophecy reveals only part of the whole picture. But when the time of perfection comes, these partial things will be useless. So here very clearly the Bible is telling us that there is coming a season when these spiritual gifts will cease. There is going to come a time where they're no longer necessary. Um, when that time of perfection is, that can be debated. But let me show you some clues that the Scripture gives us in the very next ver verses where those clues begin. 1 Corinthians 13, 11, and 12, when I was a child, I spoke and thought and reasoned as a child, but when I grew up, I put away childish things. Now we see things imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror, but then, so future tense, we will see everything with perfect clarity. Now, we don't see things with perfect clarity yet. All that I know now is partial and incomplete, but then I will know everything completely, just as God now knows me completely. Now, we don't know everything completely like God knows us completely. Some cessationists might imagine that they do. But here, very clearly, we see in the scripture that this day is not yet. This time has not yet come. Could this be the canonization of scripture? Well, no, because this is still speaking of future tense. This is talking about time, uh, when time is no more, when it's in eternity, when we know everything completely, even as God now knows us. So until then, spiritual gifts are required. Look, in eternity, you don't need prophecy. Why? There's no future. There's no time. Prophecy is unnecessary in a place where there is no time. The gift of healing is unnecessary in a place where there is no sickness. The gift of tongues is unnecessary in the place where we know that perfect union with God, with nothing inhibiting that connection. Um, so again, 1 Corinthians 13, verses 9 through 12 that's not an example of the spiritual gift ceasing, and really that's about it. They don't have any other verses. So you can do away with this very damaging myth that the spiritual gifts and therefore the gift of tongues are no longer for today. You can toss that to the side confidently knowing that the scripture speaks in direct contradiction to anyone who would ever claim something so wild. It's not like God just arbitrarily places his finger on the timeline of history and says, here is where I suddenly stop interacting with mankind. Myth number six, this is kind of an interesting one, but it's still one we have to address. Myth number six, because Jesus didn't pray in tongues, neither should we. Well, first of all, I don't deny that Jesus probably didn't pray in tongues. In fact, I'm almost positive he didn't pray in tongues. But the lie is that because Jesus didn't pray in tongues, neither should we. So I agree, Jesus didn't pray in tongues. Let's grant that premise. Jesus didn't pray in tongues. How then one would conclude that therefore that means we shouldn't pray in tongues is just beyond me. Here's what I wrote in praying in the Holy Spirit. Why didn't Jesus pray in tongues? The same reason Jesus never shared a testimony of being saved from sin. He was perfect. Praying in tongues supplements my inability to pray. Jesus lacked no ability to pray. Praying in tongues helps me when I don't know what to pray. Jesus always knew what he should pray. Praying in tongues helps me to pray according to God's will. Jesus was God's will in action. So the gift of tongues is supplemental. Well, why didn't Jesus need to receive healing? Well, he was raised from the dead, of course. We know that, but he didn't know sickness. Why? Because that was the healing virtue flowing through his body. So in the same way, we see that it's because of Jesus' perfection that he did not pray in tongues. You and I do not have that, at least not yet, and therefore the gift of tongues should still be used by the believer. Myth number seven, you could become demonized if you attempt to pray in tongues. Now, every time I talk about the gift of tongues, this comes up. Christians who are just ultra paranoid about demons under every bush saying, well, what about a demonic tongue? Well, first of all, I don't see anything in the scripture that talks about that. Even if that's a reality in the occult or the new age somewhere, it doesn't hold any real power over the believer who's actually approaching God for the gift of tongues, as we'll see right now from Luke 11. But I think a bigger problem than demon oppression in the church is demon obsession. Believers are just so fixated on demons and demonology. And it's like, my goodness, there's no spirit more powerful than the Holy Spirit. It's time to put the focus back on Jesus. Let's look at the scripture here, Luke 11, 11 through 13. The Bible says, you fathers, if your children ask for a fish, do you give them a snake instead? Or if they ask for an egg, do you give them a scorpion? Of course not. So I love this, so gentle. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? I trust not in my ability to receive from heaven. I trust in Christ's ability to give from heaven. I'm trusting in him. If you approach the Father God in the name of Jesus, 
asking to be filled with the Holy Spirit in such a way that it overflows in the gift of speaking in tongues, do you really think that a demon could take that opportunity and say, oh goodness, he's asking God for a spiritual gift. Let me sneak in there. I'm sorry, that's just not going to happen. It's not possible. The, the power of the Holy Spirit is immensely greater than any demonic power that could be. So th this is not a scenario that's likely or even possible for the everyday believer. Now, some in the cessationist camps might say something like, well, you know, it's the spirit of Kundalini or it's, it's some new age practice. And, and, you know, they really stir up these uh, tinfoil hat conspiracy theories that have no grounding in reality whatsoever. We all know that the enemy can, of course, mimic what God does, or at least attempt to mimic, but that doesn't necessarily mean that this should be a point of obsession for us. I mean, let's say they are right. Let's say, let's just grant it. I don't believe this is reality for a second, but let's just say that it is. Let's say that the cessationist is correct in saying that the gift of tongues is not for today, that what we're doing, that what they call gibberish just isn't of God. That doesn't mean that the pendulum swings all the way in the opposite direction. That doesn't therefore mean that we can conclude that the gift of tongues is demonic in nature. Wait, all that would mean is that we were speaking gibberish, but out of emotion and purity of heart. Then you could put speaking in tongues along the same lines as crying or humming or clapping or shouting. It's an emotional expression that's Godward that wouldn't necessarily harm us in any way. So at best, it's a gift of the Holy Spirit that causes us to have our prayers supplemented. At the very worst, it's an emotional expression unto God in worship and prayer. Then tell people they can't hum. Tell people they can't clap. Tell people they can't cry or shout before the Lord because that's just an open door for the enemy. No, this is just nonsense, hyper paranoia, fear that's coming from the enemy trying to keep people from exercising these spiritual gifts. So no, myth number seven is not true. Toss that to the side, this idea that you could become demonized if you attempt to pray in tongues. It's just, it's just nonsense here. Okay, myth number eight, and this is a big one, and this is actually one of the myths that prevents people from receiving this gift. Myth number eight, you cannot control the gift of tongues. Now, skeptics believe this, and Christians struggling to receive the gift of tongues believe this. But what does the Bible teach? Well, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians 14, as we just read, is Paul the Apostle regulating the use of tongues in a public assembly. How could he possibly regulate the gift of tongues in a public assembly using an epistle if the gift of tongues wasn't under the control of the individual using it? Why would God command through his apostle in an epistle to tell the people to do something that was not possible? Why would he say, control that gift, if the gift could not be controlled. Many believers, when wanting to receive this gift, they, they come under this assumption that the Holy Spirit's gonna literally reach out, grab their tongue, move it up and down, and cause them to make all the noise. That's not the way it works. I mean, what spiritual gift can you name that doesn't require your participation in some degree? I mean, lay hands on the sick and they shall recover, but you still have to lay hands, prophesy according to the word of God, but you still have to open your mouth and speak the words that you heard in heaven. I mean, think about it. There is no spiritual gift that you, 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 you can exercise without the participation of your will. Why would the gift of tongues be any different? All spiritual gifts require some exercise of faith and free will on the part of the one using them. Why would speaking in tongues be any different? Now, I know I told you I was going to give you eight myths, but I actually have a bonus one for you. Number nine. See, this is why you stick around to the end of these. And I don't, I don't even want this in the chapters. This is a hidden gem for those who, who stick around for this. Number nine, you need to speak in tongues in order to be saved. Let me read a verse to you here, a portion of scripture, I should say, found in Ephesians. And I'm going to go to chapter number two. I'm going to read verses eight and onward, where the Bible very clearly says, God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So none of us can boast about it, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus, so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Very clearly, the Bible teaches that salvation comes by faith through grace, or by grace through faith. This is how we come to experience the saving work of the cross, by placing our faith in Christ. And so, you're not saved by speaking in tongues. And this would actually be a backwards way of looking at it because Romans chapter 8, verse 9 makes it clear that those who don't have the Holy Spirit are not saved and that in order to be saved, you have to have the Holy Spirit. So if we take that into consideration, then it would be 
a backwards way of thinking if we said that you have to speak in tongues in order to be saved. Even if you said you have to speak in tongues at the moment of salvation, you're still adding a work besides faith to the equation, and that's not what the Bible teaches at all. Now, you have to be saved in order to speak in tongues, but you do not have to speak in tongues in order to be saved. In fact, the greatest mark that you've experienced the work of the Holy Spirit, that you have him working in your life, is the character and the nature of Christ in you, as we see demonstrated in Galatians 5 to the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Those fruits, those character traits, are the ultimate signs that the Holy Spirit truly lives in you, not necessarily the gift of speaking in tongues. Though, as you heard from my teaching here, the gift of tongues is very important. Now I want to pray, and then I want to talk to you about something, so don't go anywhere. Let's pray right now. I want you to begin, and Tim, we do not need to put it on the screen, because I want them to be able to put this just in the live, in, in private, and then on the replay, if you want to leave it in the comments, you can. I want you to put on the screen right now your prayer request. I want you to begin to write aloud right now. Write, write, write it there. Write it on the screen. Write those things that you're believing God for. You're believing for a healing. You're believing for deliverance. You're believing for the salvation of a loved one. I want you to begin to type that on the screen right now. And I believe that as we touch and agree that the power of the Holy Spirit is going to flow here, that anointing is present. Every bondage has to be broken. Sickness must go in the name of Jesus. And not only are we going to pray those things, we're going to pray for healing, deliverance, empowerment, yes, and the anointing is flowing right now. But we're also going to pray that the Holy Spirit would give you this revelation and he would cause it to be deposited in your spirit, deep within the spirit man. Come on, let's pray, let's believe, let's ask the Lord to do this now. Father, in the name of Jesus. I thank you, Lord, that you're touching your people. I thank you, Lord, that the anointing is flowing. I thank you, Father, that every bondage is broken. I thank you, Lord, that your healing virtue is flowing. And Lord, I ask right now that you would begin to overwhelm your people in your presence and power. Let that virtue begin to flow in a way that they can sense it on their physical beings in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, I give you the glory. I give you the honor. Give us your grace, Father, to know your word, to walk according to your will. Thank you. Even now, bondages being broken, I give you the glory, Jesus. I give you the praise. Healing is taking place. I thank you, Lord. Come on, just receive. That's the peace of God flowing over you now. That's the peace of God. That's his power, his presence. I give you the glory, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Someone's ears have just been healed. I give you glory. Thank you, Jesus. Arthritis just been healed. I thank you, Lord. Someone with an addiction, that addiction is being broken right now. Torment of the mind, I break, I feel that one strong. Torment of the mind, I break that bondage in the name of Jesus. And Father, we thank you that as we've received from your word, that you would cause the word to break our mindsets. We humble ourselves before you. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. And I want you to write it in the comments because you believe Right, amen. Now, something I wanted to ask you. What is waiting for you on the other side of your step of faith? Well, think about the fact that Peter stepped out of the boat, which was his certainty, and onto the waves as he was called out by the Lord. Peter left the boat and stepped onto the water because he knew it was Jesus that was speaking to him. Peter was not walking on water. He was walking on the word. Think about how when the children of Israel sought to step into the promise that God had given to them, what did they do? They marched around the walls of Jericho and released shouts of victory, and those walls came down. Think of Moses, who before him was the Red Sea, behind him the armies of Egypt, seeking his destruction and the destruction of the people that he had led there. What did he do? He took that step of faith, and that sea became a pathway. God makes a way where there seems to be no way. God makes a way where there seems to be no way. What is waiting for you on the other side of your obedience? What is waiting for you on the other side of your step of faith? So often we're filled with fear, and we may say we have faith, but then when the Holy Spirit moves us to do something we hesitate, we wait, and delay is disobedience. And we put out our excuses thinking that they'll somehow be accepted by God. 
And God is calling you to the deep. God is calling you to cross the sea. God is calling you into the promise. Will you take that step of faith? Or will you allow fear to rob you? You know, in this season, many people are panicking. And, and because of this, they're missing opportunities in the spirit. Let me say that again. People are panicking. And because people are panicking, they're missing opportunities in the spirit. Some of the greatest spiritual opportunities come in the most seemingly dark times. Some of the greatest opportunities come when people's fear is at an all-time high. Let me tell you, Jesus said that sometimes the world is wiser than his own children. Why? Because the world understands sometimes dynamics that the church doesn't even get. And I'll tell you this right now, even while the rest of the world is panicking right now, they're worried, they're concerned for their futures, there are wicked men and women who have better discernment than some people in the church. And they right now are seeing the opportunity and they're going to increase their influence. They're going to increase their wealth. They're going to increase their opportunities and open doors in this season while everyone else is panicking. Why? Because they're keeping their calm. They trust in their riches. Don't you trust in God? And because of this, we can miss opportunities. It's during the storm that there's the opportunity for the miracle. It's during the chase that there's an opportunity for rescue. It's during the march that there's an opportunity to step into that promise. Don't waste the famine. Don't waste those seasons where faith is required because it's in those seasons that you take your biggest steps. We as a ministry right now are taking bigger steps of faith than we ever have before. While others are panicking, we're saying, no, our eyes are fixed on Jesus. And we're going to take steps of faith into our future, into the promise. I want you to step with me. I need you right now to give a one-time gift to David Hernandez Ministries or become a monthly ministry supporter. You can do that by going to davidhernandezministries.com slash donate. And in a moment, I'll be reading the names of those of you who give, at least some of you. I just want to thank as many as I can. I'll be reading those names, and I can see them coming onto my phone as you give at davidhernandezministries.com slash donate. This is an opportunity in the Spirit. While others are panicking, while others are saying, well, let me hold back, let me wait and see. No, 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 no. We are people of faith. Either we believe the word or we don't. And it's in these opportunities that God is looking for people with faith. Don't miss the promise because you were too afraid to take that step. Don't miss the promise because you were too afraid to obey. I don't know about you, but I don't want to miss any opportunity. And I don't look at circumstances. I look at God's word. I don't look at what the world says. I look at what the word says. And that's why this ministry has experienced favor and growth and expansion, even in this season. So I invite you to help us as a ministry to continue to do these live streams, to continue to release content, to continue to do events all around the world. We are seeing souls saved, people delivered, people healed, and the church empowered. The kingdom is expanding. Step out of the boat now. Step into faith. Step onto that word and into a miracle. I'm seeing now, I want to thank Denise for becoming a monthly supporter. Thank you, David. I like that name, by the way, for becoming a monthly supporter. Thank you, Sylvia, for becoming a monthly supporter. Danny, thank you for your one-time gift. I appreciate that. Charlene, thank you for becoming a monthly supporter. And then I also see other names coming up, Andrea. And then I see Nessie and Rhoda and Angela. Thank you, Teresa. Thank you, to Philip, all of you becoming monthly supporters of the ministry. Again, davidhernandezministries.com slash donate. Don't hesitate. Don't wait. At a time like this, usually on these streams, you're thinking, oh, someone else will give. Someone else will do it. No, no, no. You be the one to step into faith. Don't let someone else take that opportunity. You step out and take it. I'm telling you, this is the key to seeing favor. This is the key to expansion. At least that's what I've experienced in my life as I've obeyed the word. Generosity opens doors of favor, and we cannot miss the opportunities before us. Thank you, Shanesha, for your one-time gift. Thank you, Lolita, for becoming a partner. Thank you, Daniel, for your one-time gift. Thank you also to TK for becoming a partner. Thank you, Murta, for your one-time gift. Yuritsi for becoming a partner. Anthony for becoming a partner. Thank you, Angelica, for becoming a partner. Thank you to Nigel for becoming a partner. And many names still coming in from all around the world. You can give from anywhere. The, the, the giving form accepts PayPal, Apple Pay, Google Pay. It'll read your device. It'll read your geolocation so to actually convert to your currency. In most cases, just double-check that form when giving. 
Charlene, thank you for your donation. Jacqueline, thank you for your donation. Robert, thank you for your donation. So many of you so generously giving. I appreciate that. Again, go right now, davidhernandezministries.com slash donate. Addie, thank you for your donation. Cindy, thank you for becoming a monthly partner. Dennis, thank you for becoming a monthly partner. And so many more coming in. I'll thank you, thank you as those continue. And if we're off the air, I'll still be able to see the names coming in uh, for now. So thank you for your support. Thank you for your giving. Now, if you enjoyed this teaching, make sure you also watch my latest teaching on the gift of tongues, at least my latest as of you know July 26, 2022. Uh, watch the teaching what's blocking the gift of tongues in your life. In this teaching, we're going to really dig deep into why many believers who want the gift of tongues aren't able to step into that expression. What are the common ways that that gift is blocked and prevented from coming out of you? Make sure to watch that right here on Encounter TV.